ready for the Q-tip. Welcome back, everyone. Well, Royce and I are just chilling out on the couch. <laughs> and I want to talk to you a bit about uh, this Embark dog DNA test. Um, this is not a sponsored video. I just thought it'd be really fun to do the Embark test on him, which is a DNA test, which tells me a bit about his breed and any health related conditions he may have. And so I did some research and I found out that this is probably one of the better tests to be using. So let's take you through the testing process and I'm going to go through the results and some pitfalls I found out about it. So we're going to talk about whether it's worth spending all this money to do this test and, uh, you know, we'll go from there. So stay tuned. I know a lot of you guys might be interested in this or have heard about it. And I thought, what the heck, let's give it a try. Well, let's take a look inside the box. As you can see, they are a research partner of Cornell. And today I got the Ancestry and the Health Kit. Very cute packaging, I must say. Oh, cool. So this tells you everything that you need to do. So basically what I need to do is uh, go online and activate an account. So just like a website to sort of fill out all of Royce's information and my information. Yeah, this is a bit about Embark. So uh, basically they're gonna analyze the DNA using research grade genotyping platform built by the scientists in partnership with Cornell um, University College of Vet Medicine. I feel like this kit is probably one of the better ones out there. Um, so let's give it a try. So we'll activate it and then there's the swabs. That's how we're gonna get our little DNA sample. And down here looks like the shipping kit. So let's take a look. So this is the swab. So apparently what I'm supposed to do is just sort of uh, make sure he hasn't eaten in the last hour or so and then uh, put the swab in his little uh, cheek pouch there and then rub it around for a good 30 to 60 seconds. Then we're gonna stick it in that little vial there. And then after that's done, I just need to uh, basically get his little uh, UPS or United Postal Service, sorry, package out of here. Uh, it's prepaid if you live in the US apparently. I'm in Canada, so I'll probably have to pay a few bucks to get this over the border. Um, and then it's got its own little tracking number and all that kind of stuff. So very cool, let's get started. Are you ready for the Q-tip? He's not a fan of this process. <laughs> all right, so we close the cap and then we shake this up a few times. Now that I have my sample, uh, they give me a little clear bag to drop it in there and I'm just going to put it in the envelope and take it to the post office. It's been two weeks and the results are back. Let's take a look. So Embark provides a really nice platform for looking at your results. I got this emailed to me and I logged in to get his information. So as you can see here, the test is really accurate for breed. Yes, he is 100% Bouvier. So that's very encouraging to get started. We'll go down here to the health summary and you can see that thankfully not a whole lot of things were found wrong with him in terms of his DNA content. What we can see is uh, that they tested for quite a few um, genetic issues here and uh, one very breed specific genetic condition. So one thing to keep in mind with the Embark is that uh, this type of analysis, you know, not all the DNA, DNA tests, the genetic tests are for relevant to your breed. So you may think that, oh, all these things were ruled out, but actually they aren't for every single breed. One thing he did have ruled out, if we click on this, is exercise-induced collapse. This is can happen in the breed, and I'm really glad the variant was not detected for him. Now, one thing that's really interesting here that I see is that uh, this level here, uh, he has an issue with. So we click on that, and this is called the ALT activity. Uh, it's a measure of liver health, and he inherited uh, two copies of a variant that uh, codes for uh, a baseline blood level of that to be low normal. So you can see here why this is important to let your vet know about this. And this is really interesting because as you can see here, I have Royce's liver value data because as many of you know, he got blastomycosis and the drug he was on is very toxic to the liver called itraconazole or Spornox. So um, when we can see is that when he's healthy and normal, the levels here, the little red dots show that they are below normal. So this is actually really cool because this you know, provide support that this test actually is worth its salt. Uh, his levels were quite low and you can see here that when they started increasing the little black dots above, you know, indicate sort of in the normal range. But for him, that meant the itraconazole was having an effect on his liver and we actually had to reduce the dose. And you can kind of see here over time as the little black dots go down toward the baseline and back down to the red dot, uh, back to his baseline. That tells me that uh, his liver was a little happier. Uh, he got away with a lot lower dose than most dogs. Um, so this is really important. This is really cool. I'm glad 
Um, there was support for, uh, you know, what I, we actually saw with his blood testing and what we had to do for his health. And now we have a genetic basis for it. So that's actually really cool. As you can see, there's additional genetic conditions here that they tested for that he was not positive for. One thing I'm really happy about is the multiple drug sensitivity that was negative. I was a bit worried because of the hydroconazole that he was on and he was on such a low dose that maybe he had some kind of issue with drug metabolism, but it looks like that's not the case. So that's really, really positive. I'll just lightly scroll through here. There's like 233 things they look for. But what I do want to draw your attention to um, is the fact that a lot of this has to do with a very specific breed. So you can see here, you know, Thrombopathia uh, American Eskimo dog. So this really has nothing to do with a Bouvier dog. Uh, I mean, some things cross over to different breeds and a lot of tests do not. They're very specific genetic markers for certain things uh, and various breeds. So, you know, a lot of this stuff, that's great. They didn't detect it, but I wouldn't expect them to do that, to detect it in him because he's not the right breed for it. So for example, this one, you can see an Irish setter. So if you have a setter, you know, that will be more um, useful for you to take a look at. And uh, it shows here, for example, how common it is in other dogs. It's in some breeds, not others, and two in a hundred Irish and uh, white setters have this. So it does explain the conditions, which is great. So it's a lot of very <laughs> technical terminology that you look at and you don't really understand. Well, they explain it in plain terms. So that is really, really awesome uh, for those um, that want that extra detail. Now, it tells you exactly where this information for the testing came from, where the gene is, how it's inherited. And if you click on here, it actually goes to the study where all this information uh, you know, was acquired. And so this is really specific study for Irish setters. So keep in mind, you know, this is not appropriate for, you know, testing in, you know, labs or other kinds of dogs that aren't setters. This seems to be the mutation they specifically found in this breed of dog. So although they, you know, you pay for this testing, you know, it may not be appropriate for your breed of dog. Now I've scrolled down to the testing here for glaucoma. And as you guys know, Royce, unfortunately has a genetic um, condition that led to abnormal you know, drainage of fluid from his eye. And so he had high eye pressure. Uh, we couldn't fix it with drops. His eye had to be removed. And the other eye has uh, severe issues as well. Uh, the pressures aren't bad yet, but it's expected that there will be an issue in the future. So back to what I was saying before about some of these tests being very specific for certain breeds of dogs. Look at this, you know, glaucoma testing. This one's specifically for Norwegian elk hounds, beagles, uh, the Basset here, uh, Chinese Sharpe. And this one right here, so this is what Royce has. He has goniodysgenesis with the glaucoma and he has pectinate ligament dysplasia of the worst kind. Like this is like 10 out of 10 really bad. As you can see here, he's negative for it, but this is actually the gene in border collies. They actually do not know at this point what gene causes this issue in Bouvier. They think it is recessive from all my research, but definitely this testing uh, is on this gene specifically for border collies and it's recessive. So... He tested negative on this test, but actually he's positive. He, we just have not found the gene for this problem yet in this breed. So this testing also looks at the coefficient of inbreeding, so the proportion of the dog's genes that are identical on the mom and dad's side. And of course, the higher they are on the chart, the more inbred they are. Now, the Bouvier is a very rare breed. They almost, you know, died out after the World Wars. So very small gene pool at the very, you know start of trying to bring the breed back has led unfortunately to a lot of inbreeding. So as you can see, Royce's coefficient of inbreeding according to their analysis is about uh, 30%. So that's higher on the list. You can see normal um, overall purebreds that the shift is to the left, which is what you want. You want kind of a, a lesser uh, number there because the higher the number is, the more chances are for you know, genetic defects and things like that due to kind of, you know, inbreeding. So as you can see, the breed as a total has shifted to the right, uh, and that's typical. Uh, he's a little bit higher in the range there. I do have an actual coefficient of inbreeding calculated for him because we do have the full pedigrees. It is a bit less than this, so who's right, who's wrong, it's hard to say. I think I'd probably go with the, the properly calculated one because we do have the exact pedigrees going back generations. So it is quite a bit less than that. But uh, just something to, to think about, um, you know, when you get prebred dogs, many of them either through popularity and overbreeding or just a really shallow gene pool because the breed is so rare, uh, you may end up with issues because they've had to do a bit of line breeding, um, you know, to try to keep the, uh, you know, certain desired traits up, but also uh, to keep the breed alive. This is the fun stuff that they analyze. So you'll see here that they, you know, took a look at some genetics for his coat color and it tells you on the right side, the impact. So as I scroll down, you can kind of see all the different things they looked for and no surprises here. Yes, he has dark fur, uh, you know, darker skin. 
and talks a bit about, you know, patterning and things like that. Uh, and a lot of things on these tests has really no impact on, you know, what he has. Yes, he can have dark facial fur. That makes a lot of sense. And yes, he has very little to no white in his coat. There's a little bit on his beard and a little bit on one of his feet. Talks a bit about his furnishings, his coat. Yes, he does not shed. So that fits with that. And that he has a long coat and has a mustache and beard. That's pretty neat. Again, talks about tail length. Um, yes, they are born with normal tail lengths. They are docked usually at the breeder about a day or two of age. And, you know, he does not have hind dew claws like a Great Pyrenees or something like that. And he is very heavily muscled uh, and that makes a lot of sense. One interesting thing here that they tell you about is performance, uh, how he does at certain altitudes. Uh, some dogs do a lot better based on where they're from genetically and how that's adapted over time. So he's got normal attitude and he also has normal food motivation. Um, some You can kind of click on that if you want to get more information, talks a bit about the gene, his results, and the scientific reference that goes along with that. So we can look also, they looked at his maternal haplotype and his paternal haplotype and it tells you a little bit kind of where he came from sort of a long, long, long time ago. So it tells you his haplotype group and kind of where, uh, you know, the original dog from his breed originated. And, you know, you can see how uh, it sort of uh, moved over into Europe, which is exactly kind of where they were mainly developed. So that's on his mom's side. Uh, apparently it's a very exotic female lineage, uh, commonly seen uh, in their breed. And the... Um, other dogs, you know, so the Collies and Yorkies are also part of this kind of uh, group. And if we look at his dad, they look at his Y chromosome. Uh, this is a different group here. And uh, you can see that, uh, you know, where there's originated from and kind of going out of Europe and kind of heading across the world. So that's really neat. So they explain everything in great detail right here. So you can kind of read, read through that. It's actually lots of fun to read and learn about all this stuff. And if you don't know some of the terms, you can kind of look it up and they, you know, have little question marks here and you can kind of, um, you know, explain like what's a haplogroup. So here you go. It explains everything of what's involved with that. So much like the human DNA tests, uh, you can actually link relatives together if you allow people to see your public profile. So if you look here, there are tons of Royce's family that are actually on here. So and it tells you exactly how, uh, how shared their DNA is. And it's not surprising. Uh, again, small gene pool of the dogs, very, you know, limited amount of genes to go around. A lot of them are highly related. Um, his father is also very, um, his father's line is also a very popular line. So I'm not really surprised. I'm going to bring you down to this one. Take a look at this face. This is Royce completely. So I'm going to click on this one just, you know, totally for funsies. Look at that. Royce and Sammy, like brothers from another mother, literally. So uh, it's very interesting. They will show you here uh, the chromosomes and where they match. So they're going to show you all of his chromosomes, both of the dogs, and areas where they're identical are in dark blue. So that tells you that. So that is really, really neat. So one of the reasons I wanted to do this was I wanted to basically give his DNA to science so we can actually find out what's going on uh, with this breed and finding the genes for glaucoma, etc. So what I did uh, is I did a whole lot of surveys. So this is all going to link his DNA with all these surveys. And if any scientist wants to learn a bit more about them, they can pull all the Bouvier data, they can pull the surveys. Um, so I did all of his stuff here, all his signs, symptoms, anything like that. You know, they do know about the blastomycosis, they do know uh, about his glaucoma. So it's all really, really helpful. Um, and, you know, right here, it just says that they, you know, they're always going to be expanding the results. When they get new results, they'll let us know. Uh, and if I have a particular question I want to talk to them, I might even email them about the glaucoma issue. I can uh, email them here at Embark. Another couple of fun things they indicate are his degree of wolfiness. You know, I think that looks at how many wolf genes are kind of, you know, have persisted through the lines, obviously very low. I would say that huskies, malamutes, dogs like that will probably have a little bit higher wolfiness there. They use the DNA to actually predict adult weight, which I think is really cool. Royce is 94 pounds, probably a bit overweight. I think 87 is actually a really good prediction. When you click on here, uh, they talk a bit about uh, genetic weight. So that's, that's fascinating to me to learn a little bit more about that. And then, of course, life stage. I mean, I told them his birthday, so they tell you basically, you know, he's an adult. And lastly, you have the opportunity to send this report to your vet, um, especially with Royce's ALT level. That's really important information. Uh, you can also submit it to the OFA. And what's really neat is I can actually download his raw DNA data. I don't know what I do with it, but basically, uh, you know, they're going to, for example, have everything sort of listed here about the, you know, the markers and the genotypes and things like that. So there are different ways they can send it to you. So I think that is really neat to be able to have that. 
So is it worth it? Is it worth spending all the money for this Embark DNA test? I would say it depends. Honestly, for common breeds like Labrador Retrievers, Golden Retrievers, Collies, things like that, that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, information about them out there, a lot of genetic testing, I would say, yeah, you're going to get your real bang for your buck. There's going to be a lot of tests that apply to your dog. And uh, especially, you know, I think it's also valuable for people that don't know what kind of breed of dog they have. You know, it, you know, maybe they've inherited things. If you have like a, a doodle, you know, your golden retriever and your lab, you know, you may have different inheritances of different things from both sides. And that's a really common breed. So I think, you know, if you don't know what kind of breed of dog you have, I think it's really handy. You may pick up on some genetic issues there. You will definitely find a little bit more about, you know, what kind of dog they are breed wise. I believe there's some limitations. I mean, I know some people have sent things in and got very unusual responses, but I think of all the testing out there, I feel that the Embark is, uh, you know, a better test. Uh, and they do work with the Cornell University. As you can see, they're right on the packaging and, you know, very science-based. And, um, you know, I, I feel that they do a really, really good job and they, you know, you can reach out to them if you have questions and things like that. So I think it's, it's valuable in that scenario. In my scenario, do I think it was worth it? Absolutely not. I know exactly what kind of dog he is. There was very few genetic markers there that specifically applied to him. Yeah, we did find out one really cool thing about that liver value. That'll be really helpful moving forward in the future. There's something that, um, you know, it can be really, really important to know, especially if they're on uh, medication that affects the liver, you may detect a problem in liver damage sooner if you know that, you know, they may be in the normal range, but that actually is too high for them, you know, so they may be experiencing damage from something. So that, that, that was valuable, but the rest of it, I don't think I'd spend my money guys. Uh, again, I wouldn't do that. Um, we'll see. I mean, my main goal was actually just to basically donate his DNA to science, like pay some money, get some fun results, take them for what they're worth. And, uh, but what I really, really want to do is release his DNA into the science world. And I gave them permission to do that. Like you don't have to do that. You can tick a box that says, I don't want that, but I did because I think we want to know more about this breed. I love this breed. I want them to thrive and do well. And so I think that was my main goal and it was achieved, you know, and so hopefully we will get more information in the future, but you know, remember guys, this also uh, a genetic um, marker variant that's detected does not mean disease. So even if you have a dog that has multiple things sort of found on this testing, don't panic. I think it's time to talk to your vet about it. But uh, because you have the genetic coding doesn't mean in that moment there's an illness. It may mean you're more predisposed to get it. But there's other things that influence gene expression. So keep that in mind. And they do make that very, very clear on each of the reports is that the, um, you know, having a variant detected doesn't mean your dog is deadly ill with whatever is going on, but maybe more testing is required. So keep that in mind. Well, I hope you learned a little bit more about dog DNA analysis. I know it's becoming really popular these days and I wanted to give it a whirl. So uh, if you have any questions, leave them do down below in the comments and we'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.